Um, just to give you a brief introduction of who we are, my name is Lena Zogai. I am the Global Product Director for PGT. I've been in the reproductive genetics field for just about four years, but I've been in genomics or genetic testing and diagnostics for um, about 10 years now. With me and our presenter, we're delighted to be joined by Jenna Miller, who is a genetic counselor here at Cooper Cooper Surgical. Just to give you a bit of information about Jenna's background, Jenna is a board certified and licensed genetic counselor. She holds a master's from um, Sarah Lawrence on human genetics. Jenna began her career at biotech startup at Recombine by providing genetic counseling services to patients and physicians. She then moved into clinical diagnostics for expanded carrier screening and eventually led Cooper Genomics clinical diagnostics team. Jenna has been with Cooper Surgical's uh, clinical science liaison since 2007. In this role, she travels around North America educating healthcare providers about genomics within the art field. Jenna is passionate about genomics education, informed consent, and ethical approaches to genetic testing. She hopes to share her enthusiasm for clinical genomics with everyone she encounters. She's also a wonderful presenter, and we're very, very delighted to have her. So Jenna, I'm going to uh, allow you to take over. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lena. And I am really excited to be here and be able to speak with you all today. I do really love genetics and talking about this. I've, I've given Genetics 101 type talks literally a hundred times, but it never gets old. Um, so I'm excited to do this again with all of you today. Here's our overview and let's dive right in. Uh, so we're starting just at the very basics of, uh, of biology, some biology 101. All of life as we know it is cellular with very few exceptions. We can debate about viruses another time. Um, if we zoom in uh, and look at the uh, structure of a cell, it looks something like this, right, in, in humans and in mammals. Um, if you look here in the nucleus, this is the part of the cell um, that we're primarily concerned with in, um, in genomics, right, because this is where the genetic material is housed. And if you were to pop open a cell and see what, um, what comes out, it would be these structures called chromosomes, right? Uh, chromosomes are tightly wound up individual packages of DNA. Uh, and in humans, we have 46 total chromosomes and they come in pairs. So 23 pairs in each pair of chromosomes, one comes from mom and one comes from dad. The first 22 pairs of chromosomes are called our autosomes. Our autosomes are just our regular chromosomes. Um, they're inherited in, in a normal manner. They are distinct from what we call the sex chromosomes, which are this last pair here, right? Um, with the sex chromosomes, most females have two X chromosomes. The X chromosome operates much like any other uh, chromosome, much like the autosomes in females who have two. Um, but in males, males don't have two X chromosomes. They have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. And the Y chromosome is kind of special because it basically only has genes on it related to male development. So it's really necessary to have a Y chromosome to develop as male. Now, again, uh, nobody that would usually, usually uh, females will have two X chromosomes, males will have one X and one Y, but nobody knows better than we do in uh, assisted reproductive technology that this is typically the case, but it's not always the case. We'll talk a little bit about that more as we go on. If you want to get a little more into the weeds about the structure of chromosomes, um, we zoom in even further. What you see are, um, are that chromosomes have two arms uh, separated by a centromere. The centromere is just a cluster of proteins that are necessary to um, the spindle fibers will attach there when it's time to uh, do cell division, right? Pull the chromosomes apart. Um, but uh, the centromere is dividing the, the P arm and the Q arm of the chromosome. The P arm uh, here, P stands for petite. So this is the short arm of the chromosome. 
Uh, the Q arm stands for comes after P. They, they didn't get creative with that one, uh, but that's the long arm of the chromosome. So sometimes on genetic testing reports, including like pre-implantation genetic testing reports, you might see um, a designation like a deletion of chromosome 8P something or chromosome 15Q, something like that. Um, now, sometimes you'll see chromosomes looking like rods, as on the left, and sometimes you'll see them looking like X's, as on the right, and that's just dependent on when in the cell cycle we are looking at. So if uh, DNA replication has occurred, uh, that S phase synthesis, uh, then we'll have chromosomes that look like X's. Uh, if that hasn't happened yet, then they look like rods. And um, in either case, this length of chromosome here uh, is called a chromatid, and these two are called sister chromatids. The reason for that is because they are identical up and down. So the gene uh, and the genetic variants and all of that that are right here are identical to what's going on right here. So if we were to unravel our tightly wound up chromosomes here, uh, excuse the train going by, if you can hear that in the background. Um, what you would see is this uh, double helical structure uh, of DNA, right? Um, DNA as a molecule is really interesting because it doesn't actually do anything. I mean, we could debate that, but I like to think that it doesn't really do anything. It's really just a storage mechanism, like a hard drive on a computer. Um, it's, it's there to encode information specifically the genes in our DNA, uh, which are these in individual instruction manuals, essentially, uh, they are telling us how to build proteins, right? Proteins are the workhorses of the cells. Those are the molecules that are actually going and getting all the functions done that are necessary to maintain and sustain life. Uh, the purpose of DNA is just to tell us how to build those particular proteins with those particular functions. Um, and these genes, these individual instruction manuals, they comprise about 1% of our genome. That's, it's really a, a small proportion of the entire whole. Um, and we used to think that the rest of the 99% of our genome was junk, junk DNA, but the more we learn in genomics, the more we're, we're realizing that those other regions actually have a lot of functions. Um, and, the, and specifically when you're looking at DNA and genes, the rungs on the ladder here um, of the double helix, that is where the information is really stored, right? Because there are four different types of molecules that can, um, that can be in any one of these places on these rungs on the ladder. Those are called nitrogenous bases or nucleotides. There are four of them, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, A, T, C, and G. Um, and again, like a store, it's, it's sort of like, a, like a, a computer hard drive, right? So all of life as we know it is stored into four units of information, just like a computer hard drive is stored into two units of information, zero and one. So you can kind of think of it as working very similarly to that. So now let's, uh, we'll spend probably most of our time today on the genetics of human disease. Um, and to start that conversation, we have to talk about variants. Um, so a variant is just a change in the expected or typical sequence of DNA. Um, here you can see an example of what we would call a point mutation or a point variant. Um, in this case, an A is changing to a G. Um, and these are, um, again, we, we're calling them variant. I'm calling them variants right now, but you may be familiar with the word mutation to describe these sorts of events where, where there are changes in the typical sequence of DNA. Uh, we're sort of in, in genomics getting away from the word mutation. People still use it, you can still use it, but we're sort of getting away from it because uh, for, well, for a couple of reasons. One is um, that variant is just a more neutral term. As a genetic counselor, I've told people before that they carry mutations and they are shocked and they say, oh my gosh, does this mean I'm some kind of mutant, right? So uh, mutation kind of has some negative connotations, but variant is truly a neutral term, uh, we all have genetic variation, right? That's a normal thing. Uh, but we're also getting away from the word mutation a little bit because we found that the vast majority of genetic variants don't actually impact health in a negative manner. 
Um, and we're, the more we learn about genomics, the more we're learning just about all the different types of variants out there. We, now we talk more about pathogenic variants versus benign variants. Um, and it's, uh, it's just a little more inclusive of all of the weirdness that we are seeing now that we are sequencing whole genomes, you know, entire sets of DNA from people on a regular basis. We're learning a lot about all of the different funky genetic variation that can occur. Most variants are inherited from our parents. Uh, that's why we look like them and we share a bunch of traits with them for better or for worse. Um, but occasionally we can have um, what's called a de novo variant, which means that we did not inherit it from either of our parents. It was a new uh, sporadic genetic change that happened in us or in the egg or the sperm that became us. If you were to compare any two people on any two different parts of the world um, at the genetic level, you would see that they're 99.9% .9 the same. We actually, humans as a species, we are very similar to each other on the genetic level. There have clearly been some uh, population bottlenecking uh, events in our past. Gorillas, for example, have a lot more genetic variation than humans do. Um, so again, we as people are very similar at the genetic level. It's really that you know less than 0.1% that accounts for all of the genetic variation that we see in humanity. And again, most of these genetic variants do absolutely nothing or they result in benign differences like differences in eye color, hair color, et cetera. There's a lot of plasticity built into that genetic codes that, that, uh, so that our genes are quite tolerant of, of a number of uh, genetic variants. So when we're talking about uh, the very few proportion of genetic variants that actually cause disease, we typically break down genetic conditions into three categories. Um, there are the single gene conditions, which we'll talk about first. Uh, then we'll go into the chromosome abnormalities where we're dealing with larger amounts of DNA. And then we'll finish up with multifactorial conditions. There are three main in inheritance patterns that we talk about when we're talking about uh, genetic conditions that are caused by issues with a single gene, a single instruction manual or blueprint in, um, in our genomes. The first is called autosomal dominant inheritance. Autosomal dominant inheritance, um, this word autosomal, remember I said before that our first 22 pairs of chromosomes are called our autosomes. That just means our regular first, first pairs of chromosomes, right? Um, so uh, an inheritance pattern that's called autosomal, that means that we're talking about a gene that's on the first 22 pairs of chromosomes. Dominant means that you really need both copies of your gene to, of, your, of a, this particular gene to be functional, to be healthy. Remember, we have two copies of every chromosome, one from mom, one from dad, and similarly, we, too, we have two copies of every gene, one from mom, one from dad. Um, and so in this case, we have a female who is affected with an autosomal dominant condition. And the reason for that is because one of her two copies of this gene uh, has a genetic change in it, a pathogenic variant, um, that means that she's basically down a copy, right, of that particular gene. And that's enough to cause disease in her. In this case, we have a female who's affected with an autosomal dominant condition, but it, these just as easily can affect males. And when um, an autosomal dominant condition is passed from parent to child, it's also irrespective of sex. Uh, so in this case, we have this female who's affected with this autosomal dominant condition. condition. It's a 50-50 chance which copy of the gene she'll pass to each of her children. Therefore, each child has a 50-50 chance to be affected with that same condition. Um, now, we at Cooper test for a lot of autosomal dominant conditions on PGTM, pre-implantation genetic screening for monogenic disorders, single gene disorders. Um, some common ones that we test for are conditions like Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is that uh, severe neuromuscular condition that typically onsets a little bit later in life. That one's a little bit tricky because a lot of people who are in this situation here where they have an affected parent and they are at 50-50 chance, they actually don't wanna know if they are affected or not for themselves, but then they come to us and say, I wanna ensure that my child will not be affected with this. So how do we test for, how do we, how do we test their embryos for Huntington's disease without knowing if 
they themselves are affected or not. We have, we have to get creative with the way we approach that. Um, probably the most common autosomal dominant conditions that come up for PG, PGTM are the hereditary cancer syndromes, at least here in the Americas. That's what I tend to see most often. Um, and that's because virtually all hereditary cancer syndromes are autosomal dominant. You, they, they're primarily caused by what are called tumor suppressor genes, um, which suppress tumors in our bodies. And you really want both of your copies functional in that case, because if you're already down one and all of your um, all of the tissues in your body, it's just that much easier for your remaining copy of the gene to acquire a sporadic uh, variant or mutation. And that's what will lead to the development of cancer. So that's autosomal dominant inheritance. Uh, then there's autosomal recessive inheritance. So autosomal, still talking about the first 22 pairs of chromosomes. Recessive means that having one working and one non-working copy of the gene is not enough to cause disease. Um, in this case, you really only need one functional copy and the other one's like a backup. And that's why when an individual looks like either of these, these people here, having one working and one non-working copy of a particular gene, uh, we don't call them affected with that condition. We call them carriers. Now, carriers of genetic conditions like these, of recessive conditions, are typically healthy. They typically have no symptoms of the conditions that they carry. Um, and, and really, all of us are carriers of genetic conditions. Um, I sometimes like to quiz people and have them guess uh, how, what proportion of people do you think are carriers of, of uh, a recessive genetic condition like this? The answer is all of us, we all carry at least one, probably multiple autosomal recessive conditions. And that's, that's just part of being human. That's how I'd like to normalize that with patients. Um, it's just part of being human to be carriers of things like this. And it usually isn't um, a problem for our health or our children's health because it's very rare for two people who carry the same condition to find each other. That's the risk, right? The risk here is that one person who carries a particular genetic condition, like say cystic fibrosis, classic example, that's the most common uh, one. I think it's about the most common autosomal recessive condition, at least in Northwestern Europe. Um, one person who carries a condition like cystic fibrosis meets another person who also carries cystic fibrosis. Now, if, if this person carried beta thalassemia instead, for example, which is more common in Southern Europe, that wouldn't be a problem, right? But if they both carry the same condition, then there's a 25% chance that they would both pass this, their non-working copies of the gene to a child. So each child this couple has together has that 25% chance to be affected. Um, again, uh, cystic fibrosis and beta thalassemia are common examples. Um, other common examples of autosomal recessive conditions are like uh, sickle cell, uh, sickle cell disease, sickle cell anemia, that's common in people of sub-Saharan African descent. Um, or uh, another common one is Tay-Sachs disease, which is common in, um, in people of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. And also I think Tay-Sachs uh, is a little bit higher prevalence in some parts of Ireland, if I'm not mistaken. I think I, we might have some people from Ireland joining us today. Um, so maybe you guys would know better than I would. Um, all right, so the last uh, inheritance pattern in this single gene category that comes up pretty frequently is X-linked inheritance. So now we're not talking about the uh, autosomes anymore. We're now talking about the sex chromosomes and specifically the X chromosome. Uh, if, I, if I had to choose a favorite inheritance pattern, it would be X-linked inheritance. Maybe that sounds a little nerdy, but maybe I'm a little bit nerdy and that's fine. Um, so in this case, it's still possible to be a carrier uh, with one working and one non-working copy of the gene, but uh, carriers are um, always gonna be female because only females have two copies of every gene on the X chromosome. They they're the only ones with two Xs. So males, uh, they can't be carriers. They can be affected or unaffected. There is no carrier for males. They're called hemizygous, which means they only have one copy. So it's just, just a yes or no there. Um, so in this case, if you have uh, a female who is a, uh, a carrier of an X-linked condition, as you see here, uh, there's still a 50-50 chance which copy of the gene she'll pass to a child. Um, but what's coming from dad really matters here as well, even if we're assuming that dad is unaffected, right? Because uh, if 
the mom here passes her uh, non-working copy of the gene to a child and dad passes his X chromosome, you end up with a carrier daughter, a female, same as mom, right? But if uh, mom passes her X chromosome and male and, and the, the father passes his why that's how you end up with an affected child and that child will always be male um so overall there's still a 25 percent chance to have an affected child but because that child will always be male that um is sort of a clue that we can use in genetic testing and genomic testing for example the very first case of pgtm was done uh, on an x-linked condition and they were just looking for female embryos. They were doing, uh, we'll talk about it at the end, a technology called FISH, where they were just looking at the, the, the sex chromosomes, Does it, is this embryo XX or XY? And they were looking for the XX embryos that they knew wouldn't be affected. Um, that condition was X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, um, but probably the most common X-linked condition that comes up in our space, in um, the ART fertility world, is fragile X syndrome. Um, fragile X syndrome is the most common inherited form of autism in boys. And um, not only, so females can be um, what we call premutation carriers of fragile X syndrome. Those are the individuals who are at risk to have a child affected with that condition, but female fragile X carriers are also at increased risk for premature or primary ovarian insufficiency, basically early menopause. So, um, that's something that we will typically test a patient for if she's coming back, you know, with uh, diminished ovarian reserve or looking like she's sliding into menopause before 40. Fragile X is probably some of the one of the things that could be considered. Um, so that is X-linked inheritance. Let's move on now to chromosome abnormalities. So with humans, with mammals, the rule of thumb with chromosome abnormalities is really that we want two copies of every chromosome, no more, no less, for an individual to be healthy. Um, other organisms like plants can tolerate funkier combinations of chromosomes, but with us, we really just want two of everything. Um, here we have an example of a sex chromosome abnormality, XXY. This is called Kleinfelter syndrome. This is something that you may be seeing in your clinic periodically. Um, males with Kleinfelter syndrome have um, tend to have azoospermia, and so they often come to us for help conceiving. They, we just typically would need to um, try and extract testicular sperm from them for ICSI. Um, sometimes we have a chromosome that is missing. That's called a monosomy for one copy. Here we have another sex chromosome abnormality that you may be seeing in your clinic sometimes. Um, this is called monosomy X or Turner syndrome. Um, Turner syndrome is uh, an, another interesting condition for us. Uh, these individuals have um, tend to have some fertility issues. Then we also have a trisomy. That's where there are three copies of a chromosome instead of the normal two. So here you can see we have trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. This is the, um, the most viable of all of the autosomal trisomies the vast majority of monosomies and trisomies of chromosomes are not compatible with life. These are the types of things primarily that we're testing for on PGTA in embryos um, because most embryos with chromosome abnormalities are, again, they're, they're not going to become babies. Sometimes you have three copies of every chromosome instead of the normal two, and that's called triploidy. Uh, so in this case, we have, again, three copies of every chromosome in the genome, and the sex chromosomes can be in three different configurations. I would say these first two, triple X or, trip, or XXY, are more common. Um, triploidy is a common finding in uh, miscarriages. I believe about, I believe it's about one to three percent of all IVF embryos are triploid, and about 10 to 15 percent of all chromosomally abnormal um, findings on like products of conception testing from miscarriages. So about, about 10 to 15% of, of all chromosomally abnormal miscarriages are caused by triploidy. Uh, triploidy also causes um, partial molar pregnancies um, if you wanna get more into the obstetrical side. Um, so triploidy is something that uh, can be a little bit tricky for next generation sequencing with PGTA. We'll talk about that in a minute. So we at Cooper have kind of 
come up with uh, some innovative ways to better detect triploidy. Fun fact about triploidy, all seedless varieties of fruit are also triploid. That's why they don't have seeds because you can't divide up these chromosomes evenly into seeds. So that's like seedless watermelons, grapes, bananas, etc. They're all triploid. Sometimes it's not the uh, entire chromosome that's extra missing. It's just a piece of the chromosome. So if there's a piece of the chromosome that's missing, that's called um, a deletion. If there's a piece of, the, of a chromosome that's duplicated, that's called a duplication. Um, in ART, we often refer to these as segmental or partial aneuploidies, um, but sometimes they can even be really small and we would call those like micro deletions or micro duplications. Moving right along here, we have the uh, translocations. So now we're, well, really all of these things, if we're looking at them in an in inherited manner, um, these fall under what we call uh, PGTSR or pre-implantation genetic testing for structural rearrangements. Mostly when we're doing PGTSR, we're looking for something like a translocation. A translocation is basically just where you have two, what we call non-homologous chromosomes. So that would be like a chromosome one and a chromosome eight, something like that. Uh, two chromosomes that are not the same, swapping pieces. Um, and if an individual is um, has a, you know, in their, in their chromosomes, their chromosomal configuration is something like this, where chromosome blue has swapped a piece with chromosome green. Uh, this is called being a balanced translocation carrier, and this is specifically a reciprocal translocation. Um, balanced translocation carriers are usually healthy individuals. They usually have no symptoms of the condition they carry, and that makes sense when we go back to our rule, which is we want two copies of every chromosome, no more, no less, right? So they still have that. They have two complete copies of chromosome blue and of chromosome green. It's just not all in the right place, but it's all there. That's why they're usually healthy. The problems begin when they, um, when they are trying to have children because then you have to figure out how do you divide up these chromosomes evenly, right? What happens if this chromosome gets passed with this chromosome? You're gonna have an extra bit of the blue area and a missing bit of the green area. That's true for this one as well. So um, individuals who carry balanced reciprocal translocations, any kind of translocation really, are at increased risk for uh, straight up infertility. Often we see them presenting with recurrent pregnancy loss, um, and, but it's also possible for them to have a child uh, with uh, some sort of developmental syndrome. It just depends, there, there are infinite possibilities with, with reciprocal translocations and many are unique to these individual families. Uh, so the presentation can be very different family to family. But that's why um, when someone is, is presenting with recurrent pregnancy loss, it's generally recommended that um, we uh, test them with what's called a karyotype, which is basically just getting a picture of their chromosomes. This is what we're looking for, these sorts of structural rearrangements like translocations. Robertsonian translocations are a little bit special. Uh, they only occur with the acrocentric chromosomes. The acrocentric chromosomes are those in which basically all of the genetic material is on the Q arm, the long arm of the chromosome. The P arm here, it's, it just has some highly repetitive uh, information on there. They're called microsatellites. It's not really a big deal if we lose a couple of, of P arms from acrocentric chromosomes. Um, Basically what happens here is two different acrocentric chromosomes fuse into one. This, uh, this little p-arm thing gets lost. So you end up with one super long chromosome like this. And just so you know, the, acro the acrocentric chromosomes are chromosomes 13, 14, 15, 21, and 22. So if you have a translocation case in front of you and, um, and you're not sure if it's a reciprocal translocation or a Robertsonian translocation, one of the easiest ways to figure that out is just which chromosomes are involved. And if 13, 14, 15, 21, or, and 22 are not involved, if it's not some combination of those, then it's, then it's a, a reciprocal translocation. It's just a, a cheater way to figure it out. Um, so again, where there were two chromosomes, there is now one long fused chromosome. So if you do a karyotype on someone with a Robertsonian translocation, they actually have 45 chromosomes in instead of the typical 46. But again, they're typically healthy because they still have all the relevant genetic information. 
Another fun fact here about Robertsonian translocations, our human chromosome two is actually a Robertsonian translocation of two chromosomes that are separate in all of our other primate relatives. So all of the other primates, gorillas, baboons, chimpanzees, et cetera, they all actually have 48 chromosomes or 24 pairs. We're the only primates with uh, 23 pairs and it's because of that chromosome two being a Robertsonian translocation. Finally, we have inversions. Basically, inversions are where we take a region of a chromosome, we, we take it out, flip it upside down, and stick it back in. That's kind of what you're seeing happening here. So it's all there. Again, it's just not necessarily in the right place. Um, I won't go too much into depth about how inversions work, but um, basically, if a patient is a carrier of an inversion, uh, there is a risk for um, deletions and duplications actually of the regions that are outside of the inversion. I know that's a little counterintuitive, but we're, so if you see an inversion in this area, when you look at say the embryos of a person who carries an, an inversion, they'll have deletions and duplications of the ABC region and the GH uh, region. But the actual inverted area is usually fine. Um, and again, people uh, who carry inversions have much the same types of issues as, as those who carry translocations with uh, recurrent pregnancy loss or infertility or uh, having a child with um, some kind of genetic syndrome. So finishing up here, uh, our genetics 101 portion with the multifactorial conditions, just one slide about this, basically multifactorial conditions occur, um, well, they're, they're really most of the common health conditions that you can think of. So that would include things like um, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, cancer. In the, uh, in the IVF infertility world, uh, common multifactorial conditions are things like endometriosis or polycystic ovary syndrome. Those are both um, pretty common multifactorial conditions that we might see in our practice. The idea here is that our genes are playing a role, but environment also plays a role in whether or not we develop a particular condition. Um, typically, there are multiple genes that are each contributing a little bit to your likelihood to develop a particular condition. So we, we think about this typically in a threshold model, meaning you have to accrue you know, this many uh, this many risk factors to develop a particular condition. So let's say we're talking about type two diabetes. Maybe I have a few genetic variants um, in my genome that increase my risk for type two diabetes, right? But how I live my life, those environmental factors, diet, exercise, et cetera, may modulate whether or not I actually accrue enough risk factors to cross that threshold and actually develop the disease. So that's typically how we think about that. Um, there is usually, we're usually not testing for multifactorial conditions. Um, this is starting to become a little bit more common in, um, in some, in some uh, aspects of genomics in general, but at this point, there isn't really a lot of clinical utility to testing for multifactorial conditions since any one genetic factor contributes relatively little. All right. so. Just to finish off here, um, I want to mention that it's not always as straightforward as we used to think it was. <laughs> um, back when I was first learning about uh, genomics and genetics, it wasn't even genomics at the time, um, which is the study of all the genes as opposed to genetics, which is a little more, it's on a smaller scale. Um, we were taught one gene causes one phenotype, right? Uh, one or one presentation, one um, health presentation, you could say. Um, but it's not, it's really not always that simple how our genes actually contribute into how we present. So there are a few different, different things that kind of modulate this. First is this concept of pe penetrance. Penetrance is a measure of how often a particular genotype correlates, you know, how often a particular gene correlates with a particular phenotype or presentation. So for example, um, if a condition had 100% 100% penetrance, that would mean every time you see that variant or that um, mutation in that gene, that individual will always 100% of the time develop disease. And that's actually pretty rare. 
for a condition to have 100% penetrance. Uh, hemophilia, for or not sorry, not hemophilia, hemochromatosis, for example, which is um, iron overload syndrome. That's actually, I believe, also common in um, Northwestern Europe. Uh, I think it's sometimes called a Celtic disease, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, hemochromatosis, iron overload syndrome. Um, that condition actually has like 10% penetrance, meaning if you, you know, on that, it's autosomal recessive. So if you have two non-functional copies of that gene, um, the likelihood of you developing symptoms is only 10%. Uh, so it's, it's again, not, not as straightforward as we might have thought. Variable expressivity is similar. It's this concept that two people with the same genetic condition may not present in the exact same way. Cystic fibrosis is a good example of this because of course there's the classic severe cystic fibrosis where we have you know, severe lung issues, digestive problems, uh, pancreatic insufficiency, et cetera. But then we tend to see a lot of people in our realm um, who, have, uh, who have isolated uh, congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens or CBAVD. They don't even know that they are technically affected with cystic fibrosis or have symptoms of cystic fibrosis because their only symptom is infertility. And, and, and these would be males, right? Only males have a vas deferens. They don't recognize that that is the case until they um, go to have children and they're having problems. We do a semen analysis, they have azospermia, um, but they, they make sperm, they just don't have uh, the tube to get sperm into the semen. So um, that's an example of variable expressivity. Both cystic fibrosis, both the same genes, CFTR, um, but vastly different presentations. Then we have X inactivation. Um, this is a really interesting concept. Um, Remember I said we want two copies of every chromosome, no more, no less. The one kind of asterisk to that rule is having to do with the sex chromosomes. In each of our cells, we only want one active X chromosome in any given cell. Males are good to go, they only have one. But for females, uh, early on in embryonic development, every cell in that early stage embryo randomly inactivates one of the two X chromosomes in those cells. Um, and because of that, you um, sometimes see really interesting presentations in, um, in females who are carriers of X-linked conditions. So for example, let, let, let's do talk about hemophilia. I brought it up before by accident, but um, hemophilia is uh, a bleeding disorder, right? It's an issue with uh, the, the factor eight or factor nine clotting, clotting factors, um, famously carried by Queen Victoria of, of the UK actually. Uh, she carried hemophilia B caused by a factor nine deficiency. And she had one or two sons who were affected, but she also had a bunch of carrier daughters who she then married off to the various royal families of Europe. And you saw hemophilia uh, popping up in various, um, in various royal families uh, throughout the, the 19th century into the, I think, the early 20th century. Um, so hemophilia is interesting when we're talking about X inactivation because um, some females who carry hemophilia actually have symptoms. Um, and that's just because of that random X inactivation pattern, which X chromosome, the functional one or the non-functional one for hemophilia is active in which cells. And depending on that unique pattern of, active, of X inactivation in that, in that woman, that will influence whether she experiences uh, uncontrolled bleeding or not. Finally, we have mosaicism, which deserves its own slide. Uh, because this is a real hot topic in our field right now. Mosaicism is um, actually something we've been seeing in genomics for a really long time. It's this concept of um, having, uh, of having uh, at least two, two or more distinct populations of cells with different genotypes in the same individual. Um, we are just starting to grapple with mosaicism over the past five years or so in ART because uh, the technology that we're now using for, for PGTA, next generation sequencing, is the first technology to really consistently uh, see mosaicism in human embryos. And we're actually finding that human embryos are very frequently um, mosaic to some degree. And we're all trying to grapple with exactly what that means for the developmental potential of that embryo. All right, so we're going to finish off our last few minutes here with a talk a little bit about um, the evolution of pre-implantation genetic testing over time. Now that we've sort of set ourselves up with that foundation of Genetics 101, we can start to talk a little bit about how um, all of that uh, 
has kind of infiltrated our world in ART and what kind of genetic testing we're doing, primarily this pre-implantation genetic testing, just genetic testing on embryos. So like I said before, the first case of PGTM was done in 1990. That was that, that um, case where they were just looking for female embryos. That was done using this technology called FISH. And the first case of PGTA, which is just screening for chromosome abnormalities in embryos, occurred a few years later in 1993. That was done by Santiago Munay, one of the legacy founders of what is now uh, Cooper Surgical Genomics. Um, so that was in 1993. We'll talk about FISH in, I think, the next slide. It had a lot of limitations, which led to it. Uh, PGTA didn't really take off for a good 15 years there um, just because of those limitations. And it wasn't until 2008 when Array CGH uh, came, um, came into being for PGTA that we really started seeing more PGTA um, throughout the world. And Array CGH was leaps and bounds ahead of FISH. And it, uh, it's, uh, we'll talk about that as well. It's, it's uh, still in use in some places, not so much where I live here in um, the United States, but uh, I think maybe where, where most of you are, it might be used a little more frequently. Um, then about six years after that, 2014, that's when we started using next generation sequencing, which is um, the sort of dominant technology that most uh, PGT labs are using now. And, um, you know, not a whole lot had happened with, with NGS and, and updating it and, and innovation up until more recent times where we started getting into some of the, the advancements that we at Cooper have been making with uh, artificial intelligence, uh, PGTAI 2.0, which we'll talk about, uh, the addition of uh, some added capabilities to PGTA. So let's talk a little bit about, again, we're going back in time and working our way forward with these, these sorts of genomic, genomic technologies that have been used. Um, so first we have, uh, we have FISH here. FISH is fluorescence in C2 hybridization. And this is where we are, um, we are testing uh, for specific chromosomes uh, with these little fluorescent probes, right? Um, the, the issue was with fish that I mentioned at the beginning were that one, they were, they were, uh, there were a few of them. One, we couldn't look at all the chromosomes. We, could all, we had to pick and choose which chromosomes we wanted to look at. And if there are any embryologists um, on the webinar right now who have been, been around since the times of fish, you may remember fish was very technically challenging for embryologists to, to perform. Uh, and it also, it wasn't very accurate. It had a high false positive, high false negative rate. It was very subjective. So you would literally be looking at an image like this and trying to pick out the, the yellow dots. And I think we might all come up with different answers for how many yellow dots are there. So that's why it sort of didn't take off. Then we have qPCR. qPCR is um, uh, a pretty basic method using you know PCR, which is so standard in, in genomics now, polymerase chain reaction. Um, in this case, uh, the, the main benefits of, of qPCR, which was really only ever used by one lab, uh, it would, gave quick results, cheap results, um, but you could only look at, at whole chromosomes. You couldn't get smaller than that. It was also a little bit finicky. Um, so it, it sort of um, has fallen by the wayside in recent years. Then we have Array CGH, which again, I said before, when it came on the market, it was really revolutionary. Uh, we could look at whole chromosomes. We could look at pieces of chromosomes. Um, it was, it was really a step up. I mean, you can look at this here. We won't go into depth on how you read these, but you could tell this is a lot more information, a lot more what we call high throughput than um, the previous methods. Um, I have that it's now defunct here, but that's mostly again in, in uh, the United States and North America where I am. Um, it did have limited ability to see mosaicism, which is sort of where uh, next generation sequencing comes into play, improving upon that. Um, so with NGS, which we'll talk about for the rest of our time here, um, we can see whole chromosome aneuploidy. We can see that segmental aneuploidy where pieces of chromosomes are extra missing. We can see unbalanced translocations. We talked about that before where there are those um, extra missing bits of chromosomes. Um, we can see polyploidy. That's things like triploidy or also haploidy. That's where there's one copy of every chromosome and then mosaicism. How next generation sequencing works, it starts with an embryo biopsy, which is more probably what, what some of you all are doing, um, where we're taking, the general recommendation is around five to 10 cells from uh, the trophectoderm. 
of the embryo. We're taking those cells, extracting the DNA, and amplifying it. This is really important with PGTA and really with, with all genetics, but especially with PGTA because we're starting with so little DNA. So making lots of copies of the DNA we have is, is an important step. Um, we take that DNA, we break it up into lots of little pieces, and we sequence each of those individual little pieces individually. We, those are, these are now called sequencing reads. We take those sequencing reads and we can compare them to a known reference sequence. All of genomics at any given time is using the same reference sequence. It's supposed to be uh, the most accurate depiction of a, a typical human genome. And so we're taking these, these little fragments that we get, these little sequencing reads, and we're comparing them and finding, mm, okay, this one is matching up to this part of chromosome eight. So you throw it in that bin. And this one over here is matching up to this part of chromosome 20 and you throw it in that bin. Um, and from there, we're just counting. This is a NexSeq, which is the, uh, the, this is sort of the hardware that we use in our lab for next generation sequencing. And here you can see um, kind of what's happening on in next generation sequencing. Uh, this is called sequencing by synthesis, where we're adding in those four nitrogenous bases or nucleotides, A, T, G, and C, but we've labeled them different colors and you can actually see when they're added. If you look really closely, this is an actual image of next generation sequencing occurring. You can see different colored dots on here based on, um, based on uh, which base is being added, pretty cool. So at that point, we're just counting fragments. How many did we see for each chromosome? If we saw a typical amount, that would indicate a normal finding. If we saw more than we expected to see or less than we expected to see, that could indicate um, a trisomy or a monosomy respectively. If the copy number is coming you know, a little bit in between, that, is like, um, that would be like mosaicism or if it's just a piece of a chromosome where we're seeing an increase or decrease in signal, that would be one of those segmental aneuploidies. With our last minute here, I want to talk just really quickly about um, AI, how, a little bit about how that works. Historically, this sequencing data here would be converted into an image for two scientists to read, and hopefully those two agree, but if they don't, they would have to bring in a tiebreaker. Uh, when you have humans uh, making inferences on images like this, that's an inherently subjective method with, um, with possibility for errors. Uh, and that's why we at, um, at Cooper recently turned to artificial intelligence to analyze our samples. Uh, basically what we did, and this is, this is kind of how artificial intelligence works, we took a computer brain, an empty computer brain, and uh, we trained it on uh, 1,000 embryo biopsy samples that resulted in healthy live born babies. That taught this, this computer brain, this neural network, this is what a euploid embryo looks like. Uh, we also gave it 650 aneuploid embryos, 250 mosaic mixtures, and 250 samples from PGTSR cases where we know what segmental aneuploidies um, to expect so that we, uh, it then is trained, it sort of graduates from school, it gets its diploma, it's now you know, capable of differentiating between these things. Um, but to really make it an expert, uh, the, this neural network, this artificial intelligence, it's often said you're not an expert until you do something 10,000 times. So on that vein, we then gave the neural network 10,000 live samples and we compared it, its call for each of those 10,000 samples to make sure it was calling correctly and so allow it to refine its algorithm. Um, and at that point, it's truly, uh, it was truly an expert. And that's now what we're using to call um, the, the PGTA um, results for our samples. And this is a truly objective method. So the exact same decision rubric is used for each and every embryo with, um, with perfect efficiency. So how this works, this is a, an example of sort of one of those images that you might see. Uh, for PGTA, although um, artificial intelligence technically doesn't use one of these, but this is sort of how it works. So you have every, every embryo will have some noise in its data, that's normal. And two different embryos might have different patterns of noise, but you can overlay the noise from both of those samples, add in a third, add in a thousand, and then you get a bell-shaped curve that you can apply to different to a, a real sample. So let's say you have a live sample here. This is, this is kind of how artificial intelligence works, right? We can uh, apply that um, that bell-shaped curve here to the uh, the live sample and determine is that noise within or without uh, the expected range of noise for a sample. So the blip on the left 
was just normal variation versus the blip on the right is a true abnormal finding. In reality, it looks something like this. It's a very complex decision tree. This is how our artificial intelligence calls sex, for example. Um, and uh, interestingly, we're seeing with PGTAI that we're seeing more euploid embryos reported, fewer mosaic embryos, um, and it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. Furthermore, we've recently, um, in the past year, added to our PGTA where we're sequencing like 10 times as much DNA as we were before, getting a lot more data per embryo. That enables us to use those, um, those SNPs or those uh, point variants in these embryos to get kind of a secondary analysis, um, a secondary assessment of the genetic makeup of the embryo. Um, that's also what allows us to see all forms of triploidy. I said that triploidy, certain types of triploidy can be difficult for NGS, but when we're using data from individual genetic variants or SNPs throughout these embryos' genomes, that allows us to see that. We can also um, use that information along with parental samples to identify did uh, a chromosome abnormality originate in an egg or in a sperm. Um, so you can kind of find out the parental origin of aneuploidy in embryos. Um, and generally, it just allows us to do 2PN validation. So, you know, if you're seeing an embryo calling it 2PN, you can be more, uh, you can be more um, confident in that. So that was, uh, that was my presentation. We have a few minutes for some questions. So uh, maybe we can bring Lena back on and see what questions we have. Thank you so much, Jenna. I honestly, just about the Genomics 101 or Genetics 101 portion, I, I didn't think that I was going to learn something new. But every time I hear you talk about this, I feel like I always pick up something new from a discussion, which is really <laughs> exciting. And also I love the fun facts that you throw all throughout the <laughs> presentation. Very entertaining. Thank you so much. Uh, Life is more fun with fun facts. For That's sure, <laughs> for sure. I do have some questions um, that right. have come in for you. Um, there are quite a few of them, but we're going to try to get to as many as we can. Um, the first one is how often does triploidy occur in embryos? Yeah, triploidy occurs about in about one to three percent of embryos. The most common cause is uh, dyspermy, having two sperm fertilize a single egg. So you may um, get around that particular cause a little bit with ICSI. Um, but we, we see triploidy even in ICSID embryos. Sometimes that could be caused by maybe complete failure of one of the steps of meiosis where you're, you know, actually making um, your eggs or sperm, probably more likely to happen in the egg. Um, but it's actually pretty common. And again, it's a pretty common um, finding on miscarriage as well, what, which is why it's really nice that we're able to see it consistently now. Absolutely. And this is the second part to that original question. Um, will a triploid embryo ever lead to a live birth? They occasionally can. It kind of depends on um, the particulars. Certain, like, uh, certain triploid emb embryos are more likely to result in a live birth than others. But when, when they do result in a live birth, uh, that, that baby typically only lives for a very short amount of time. So it's, it's really something that, that we would want to avoid. Okay, thank you so much. And this other question, I'm, uh, I think it's with regards to structural rearrangements. Mm -hmm. Are uh, karyotypes common for patients who are experiencing reoccurring IVF failures? Or is this something that um, you have to get done? So is this a common practice in which a clinic would recommend a patient to get karyotype if they're really just experiencing recurrent uh, failures? Yeah. Um more often we see karyotypes being ordered for patients who um, are experiencing recurrent loss. That's what most of the guidelines suggest, but it could be considered, a karyotyping could be considered for someone who's experienced um, recurrent failure as well, especially if you're not doing PGTA, at, uh, you weren't at all in the first place. Um, but that, that, is a, that is an option. I know of a, some clinics who order karyotypes on every patient who comes in the door just to be safe. So different people will approach it different ways. It probably also depends on the healthcare system in your country of origin. And how common are, and this is just now my question, how common are uh, structural rearrangements or, or carriers of a structural uh, uh, translocation that come through IVF? And is that higher than general population? It's definitely higher than the general population um, because 
you know, they're more likely to be represented in, in an infertile population. I remember I asked, I asked my undergrad professor this question once, like how common are these things? And he had no idea. I think I've looked it up and it's, it's around like one, 2% of people. It's, it, they're, they're relatively rare, um, but we do see them a lot more often in, in our field, especially at, you know, at Cooper when we're, we're doing PGTSR every day, we see them all the time. Right, right. Um, how does UPD or, or uh, uniparental disomy play a role into chromosomal abnormalities? Ooh, that's a great question. That's like some genomics 201. Um, so uniparental disomy is where you have two copies of a chromosome, which is what you want, right? But they both come from the same parent. So both of your copies of chromosome 15, for example, come from mom instead, and you don't have any from dad. Some chromosomes, that's not a problem. Um, but there are certain chromosomes where that really is a big problem because we have genes that are imprinted, meaning uh, you're only going to use embryos, or sorry, you're only going to use uh, your copy of a gene that comes from one parent, um, and you're not going to use the other copy. And, and our, our, our genomes are somehow able to tell which one came from our mom versus which one came from our dad. And um, so uh, the best example of uniparental disomy and imprinting are, is chromosome 15 and this, um, this prater willi uh, angelman region on chromosome 15, where you see um, if you have uniparental disomy uh, of chromosome 15 that's maternal, meaning you don't have any paternal copies of chromosome 15, then you have prater willi syndrome. Prater has no father. Um, versus if you have, um, if you have a, uh, if you have UPD, but it's all coming from, uh, both of those chromosomes are coming from your dad, then you have Angelman syndrome, which is a totally different syndrome with a totally different presentation. It's just dependent on which genes are imprinted on that chromosome 15. Um, so yeah, that comes up occasionally. That's also something that we consider sometimes when we're looking at mosaic embryos. Uh, if, if, the, if the mosaic finding is, um, on one of those chromosomes where we know that uniparental disomy can be an issue, that is sometimes a reason to um, deprioritize that embryo further. And this is a really rare occurrence, I take it. Yes, yes, uniparental disomy is very rare. And then speaking of mosaicism, uh, based on your experience, how often are mosaic embryos transferred? And then what, um, based on your experience, what are patients, how do patients feel about transferring a, a known mosaic? This is a great question. Um, I mean, and, and this may again be a little bit country specific, um, but uh, there was a really interesting presentation at the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, uh, ASRM, a few weeks ago, where um, a genetic counseling student reported on um, how how likely, I think she surveyed about 100 IVF clinics and asked them how likely are you to put back um, a mosaic embryo. And I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, about 70% said that they would, but only like a third said that they actually had done it. So more were willing to do it than not. And that was interesting because there was a paper just a couple years ago in 2018 that surveyed these individuals and or surveyed a similar, even more clinics, I think, and it came back only 50% were willing to transfer a mosaic embryo. So it seems like people are becoming more comfortable with it. Patients, in my experience, are much more um, willing to explore that because you know these, these mosaic embryos, they, don't, they, they have a, a decreased chance to become a baby compared to a euploid embryo, but it's not a 0% chance. And we all know patients who would take even a 1% chance, even a 0.1% chance, right? There are Facebook groups of these of patients who have mosaic embryos and they're all talking about, you know, should we do it or should we not? And it's it's a big topic in the patient community as well. Yeah, it's a, definitely always a hot topic. Thank you so much, Jenna, for your time. Thank you for your thoughtful presentation. I really enjoyed it. I'm sure everybody watching did as well. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of this presentation and this Q&A session. So thank you all for your time. I hope you all have a wonderful day.